This is a brief introduction to the civil history of England, and I'll be doing similar introductions on the history of theology and the history of science, but we will not get to those this class period. We need to understand a little bit about the history of England because many of the works we will be reading assume that the reader knows something about this or show that there are people playing on different aspects of this. It starts, for our purposes, with Henry VIII. In 1529, Henry, who wanted to divorce yet another one of his wives and marry someone else, uh, broke with the Church of Rome, and he established himself as the supreme head of the English Church. Moreover, he had a couple of people executed, a couple of Catholics executed, Thomas More and Cardinal John Fisher. That created some bad blood between the English monarchy and the Catholic Church. In 1536, he dissolved the monasteries. He said, nope, there aren't going to be monasteries anymore, and he took what treasures he could from them and closed them down. So there was a very uh, adversarial relationship between Henry VIII and the Catholic Church. Uh, moving a little bit later in the 16th century, we come to Queen Elizabeth, who reigned for a very long time, as you can see, 45-year reign as the Queen of England. Um, when she took the throne in 1558, she established the English Protestant Church as an entity in its own right, retaining, as the monarch of England, the supremacy over that church. In 1581, during Elizabeth's reign, the conversion of English subjects to Catholicism with intent to subvert their allegiance to Elizabeth becomes treason, punishable by death. That's an odd sort of thing looked at in the abstract. So remember that date, 1581. We'll come back and we'll talk about what caused that. In 1587, Queen Elizabeth had Mary Stuart executed. Why? Because Mary Stuart was Catholic and there was fear that there would be a movement to put Mary Stuart on the throne, and it was unacceptable to many people, obviously unacceptable to Queen Elizabeth, to have Mary Stuart put on the throne. 1588 is a very famous date during her reign, the defeat of the Spanish Armada, which uh, removed in large measure a threat to English power. And in 1593, the Act Against Papists was enacted, and that act against papists restricted all uh, Roman Catholics to live in one place and never travel more than five miles away from it. It's a kind of extended house arrest. All of that seems exceedingly harsh, but there was a reason for it, and that reason has to do with Pope Pius V. Pope Pius became Pope in 1566, during Elizabeth's reign, and in 1570, he issues a bull regnans in excelsis, denouncing and excommunicating Elizabeth, the pretended Queen of England, releasing her subjects from allegiance to her, and threatening Catholics who obey her orders with excommunication themselves. This was suicidal from the standpoint of Catholicism. Catholics became, in essence, uh, automatically suspect of terrorism. From the 1570s onward, Catholic priests came in England seeking secretly to reconvert England to Roman Catholicism. And it's on account of that that some of these harsh measures were adopted by Elizabeth and subsequent English monarchs. James I was James VI of Scotland. But he, upon Elizabeth's death, became James I of England, unifying the monarchy, although the countries of Scotland and England remained separate in other ways. They had separate parliaments and so forth. In 1605, some Catholics, uh, headed by Guy Fawkes, attempted to blow up the Houses of Parliament with gunpowder. They wanted to move gunpowder under the Houses of Parliament and then light it off. They were caught. The gunpowder plot was thwarted, but you can well understand how this would make the English feel 
about the Catholics. Well, they said that they owed no allegiance to the crown, and now here they are engaging in acts of open terrorism. So that was definitely a point that soured English relation toward the Catholics. Charles I was crowned the King of England, but he married an ardent Catholic. So 1625, we've moved on from King James of King James Bible fame. Um, Henrietta Marie was a princess who was so ardently Catholic that when they tried to have an English wedding ceremony for them, she would not attend. She attended a different ceremony in France, but she would not even engage in anything that the English church uh, was doing. So there's a lot of bitterness there between the Roman Catholics and the Protestants, even though she had married a man who was verbally, at least, a member of the Church of England. Uh, Charles promised Parliament that he would keep all the restrictions in place regarding Catholics, but in correspondence with Louis the Thirteenth, he secretly promised that he would relax those restrictions. So he was saying one thing to one group and another thing to another group. Sounds like some politicians we may know. Charles was not popular with Parliament, and so the British Parliament uh, convened in 1640 and would not uh, shut down for uh, quite a number of years. They began accusing various members of Charles's court of treason. So things escalated very sharply. Parliament was strongly Protestant, even Puritan. Uh, Charles was not. In 1642, it broke into open war. And in 1649, Charles was caught and executed. That killing of the king, that regicide, remains something vivid in the English mind. And you have to imagine being someone in a land that's been torn apart by violence over religious matters like this. Uh, this became a very, very sore point with many of the English. The man who took power after the brief period of interregnum was Oliver Cromwell. Um, in 1653, he began what was called the Protectorate, and as Cromwell died in 1658, he ruled the Protectorate with an iron hand. Cromwell was a brilliant military leader. He created the New Model Army, with which he basically defeated everyone everywhere. He's particularly hated in Ireland because of the way that he put down rebellion among the Irish. The Irish, of course, uh, are majority Roman Catholic, and so Again, that bitterness between the Catholics and the Protestants was fomented by this. Uh, Cromwell saw himself as a new Moses, a Puritan Moses, but his son was not able to hold things together. So in the span of a brief year from 1658 to 1659, the uh, Second Commonwealth fell apart. In 1660, Charles II, son of Charles I, was brought back. The people who had been involved in his father's execution were themselves executed. That was a condition of his return. So this was a period of uh, returning to the monarchy in England. It was also a period of moral laxity. The court of Charles II was shocking in its lack of morals, and that was something that many people remarked on at the time. Uh, London suffered some disasters in this time. In 1665, there was a, an outbreak of bubonic plague in London, and everyone who lived in central London or had work there went home to the countryside to wait out the plague. In 1666, the Great Fire of London destroyed a large portion of the city. Charles II was Protestant, but his Catholic brother, James, the Earl of York, was next in line for the throne. And as Charles produced no male heir, there was great fear that when he died, they'd get a Catholic on the throne. Because of the bad blood between the Protestants and the Catholics, this was not something that was welcomed. In an effort to head this off, James' daughter was married to William of Orange, who was a Dutch uh, 
nobleman and a Protestant. That it was thought that that would make for a safe transition of power from Protestant to Protestant. In 1678, a fellow named Titus Oakes uh, played up on the fears of the people regarding Catholicism and declared that there was a popish plot to kill Charles II and put James on the throne. So in 1679, a bill was put forward which, if it passed, would have excluded by law all Catholics from the British monarchy forever. People divided into two parties, the Tories and the Whigs, as to whether they thought that this bill was a good idea or a bad idea. So that's the origin of those party names, which we still have in England to this day. It all came about as a result of the exclusion bill. That bill did not pass at that time, and indeed in 1685, Charles died, and James, the Catholic monarch of England, the last Catholic, was crowned upon the death of his brother. He tried to secure religious liberty for English Catholics and for nonconformants of, of various kinds, but he had a quarrel with the Scottish Presbyterians, the Covenanters, and he persecuted them quite bitterly. He was in turn very unpopular and was forced to flee the country in 1688, when William of Orange was asked to come in with his wife Mary, James' daughter, and to reign as co-monarchs of England. Uh, James died in exile about 13 years later. William of Orange ushered in the Glorious Revolution. This is the beginning of what's known as the Hanoverian Dynasty. He published a Bill of Rights which extended a uh, certain amount of religious toleration to many people, notably not to Catholics. This is the point at which the controversy over the divine right of kings began. The Jacobites were those who felt that James was still the rightful king and that he or an heir of his should be restored. Um, Mary, William's wife and co-regent, died in 1694. In 1698, the Popery Act was passed, and it, when the Popery Act was passed, there was actually a bounty put out on Catholic priests. These priests who would come in in hiding uh, you could get a hundred pounds uh, for denouncing and leading to the capture of a Catholic priest. So, as you can see, that's 1698. That's within the period of time where we're going to be reading sources. And what you will see is that some of the deists are going to play on that. In 1701, the Act of Settlement formally does what was, was not uh, able to be done a little earlier. It prevents forever Catholics from taking the throne of England. So that Act of 1701 uh, settles that question. Briefly, why is all this important? First of all, we need to realize that by the year 1700, a large majority of the English people had a deep distrust of Catholics and Catholicism. There were some real grievances there. There were also some imagined grievances. The gunpowder plot was real with Guy Fawkes. The Popish plot that Titus Oakes talked about was a sheer fabrication. That never happened. That was just a, a fictional story. Uh, but in the English mind, some people took them both equally seriously. Questions of religious toleration were live issues. How much toleration should be extended to Protestants who aren't members of the Church of England? That was an open question and a question that was being debated actively at this time. The deists were going to make use of both of these factors, the English dislike of Catholics and the English sympathy for toleration. So you'll see them on the one hand trying to attack Christianity by attacking Catholicism, and on the other hand, trying to obtain toleration for themselves by pointing to English principles of toleration. 